Welcome, welcome, welcome. I would like to welcome you to episode 347 of the Unpopular Podcast. This is the man, the myth, the legend, Jalen Hunter. And here at the Unpopular Podcast, I'm not only ask you to agree with me, I'm asking you to hear me out. Legacy is 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 a, a fragile thing sometimes. And when I say sometimes, like there, there, there are some people and there are some legacies that no matter really what happens, it, it doesn't change their legacy that much. For instance, if LeBron James never wins a championship again, I think his legacy is cemented. His legacy is stamped. You know, you know, he'll go down as one of, if not the greatest basketball player to ever live. Uh, four MVPs, four championships, four finals MVPs. We know who LeBron James is. His legacy is not really in danger. To be honest with you, Steph Curry's in that same road. Like, I, if he never wins a championship again, he was part of a dynasty. He has four rings, one final, uh, one finals MVP, two MVPs. You know, changer of the game. We know who Steph Curry is. Same thing with, I mean, all the stuff that went on with Tiger Woods. We still know Tiger Woods as arguably the greatest golfer of all time. Legacy, hell. We talk about Serena Williams in such a positive light and a great light, which we should. Serena Williams is one of the greatest tennis players to ever live. Nobody ever talks about outside of the one uh outside of the one tournament she won when she was pregnant. She I don't think she won after that. Now, of course, we're talking about age, but legacy for some players is usually cemented. And there's nothing that you can really do to change that. And that's why pretty much the majority of this episode and and I need to, we need to break down this whole James Harden thing. Because when we talk about legacy, James Harden's legacy is still being being formed, still being built, still being created. And oh man. Let's talk about it. So the other day, free agency started, and the biggest news that we got pretty much the day before free agency started actually was James Harden opting into his contract, opting into his like $35 million with the 76ers, and then instantly you heard they are going, they're working on a trade. And I think Brian Windhorst said this. So shouts out to him. This is pretty much the NBA's equivalent of the transfer portal. So I will say James Harden was smart in that instance. You understand that if you were to opt into your contract, the team that you can work with the team in trading you and and you have more options outside of you opting out, becoming a free agent. Now your options are really limited because you're working with the teams that have salary cap and and this and a third. So now you can possibly go to a championship caliber team instead of if you were to opt out, you can only go to really a team that has the most cap space, like maybe the Houston Rockets, the Indiana Pacers, uh, maybe, I don't know, the San Antonio Spurs, something like that. So you pretty much essentially dictated how you are going to be handled, which you know, you have to give you have to give kudos. That that's smart. That's smart. That is that is smart. And that is yet another example of player empowerment. You know, J- James Harden understands I have more control and I can kind of dictate more where I go if I were to opt into a contract outside of opt out of a contract. So let's talk about this whole situation. And we, we have to talk about it from a few different standpoints. Let's first answer the question, how did we get here? How did we get just two years ago, James Harden essentially demanding a trade out from Brooklyn to Philadelphia to play alongside James Harden? I mean, to play alongside Joel Embiid. How did we get here? Well, first and foremost, we got here because of... Un, unmet expectations. I talk about expectations a lot on this show. 
I talk about expectations a lot. Uh, when we talk about either unrealistic expectations that teams have, unrealistic or t- uh, exceeding expectations, every team, every player should have an expectation of how their current situation or how their career should go, right? And when you pair James Harden, who we know the history of James Harden, we know the James Harden from New uh, Houston. Hell, we even know to a lesser extent, of course, but the James Harden from Brooklyn. Brooklyn, when you pair James Harden with an MVP caliber at that point, an MVP caliber player in Joel Embiid, you expect at least to make it to the conference championship, at least, and that is the at and, and emphasis on the at least part. You expect such a high turn of investment or turn on investment when you trade a Ben Simmons, who, by the way, before the trade was a a multiple time all star. You trade him to get James Harden, a, a more offensively minded, more offensively gifted player. So. That's that's when when when. You pair him up, then you see the emergence of Tyreek Maxey and how he's emerging as one of the best young guards in the league. The expectations are through the roof. You know, you expect to at least in in the, the the I cannot emphasize enough at least make it to the conference championship. Because again. You have a former MVP at the time he wasn't an MVP, but you have an MVP caliber player in, in Joel Embiid. You have a coach in Doc Rivers who's been to the NBA Finals, who's won an NBA championship, and you have an emerging star, and you have a solid team. Hell, people love, people love to, to, to crap on Tobias Harris, but he is a solid fourth or fifth piece. So when those don't happen, when expectations don't happen, let me tell you what happens. There you go. That let's let's go that route. Let me tell you what happens when expectations aren't met. Players start to get restless. Players start to get upset. Teams start to get restless. Teams start to get upset. Fans start to get restless. Fans start to get upset. So now you're in a situation where those expectations start to turn into frustration because it's like why is it that what we were promised or what we know we're capable of is not happening so then unreal un- unrealistic and un ceremonious fingers start to get pointed well maybe we're not reaching this point because of of x player Maybe we're not reaching this point because of the coach. Maybe we're not reaching this point because injuries. It's hard to explain. Actually, no, it's not. It's not that hard to explain why we look up and Joel Embiid, who is now at the reigning MVP, James Harden, who is a former MVP, former sixth man of the year, multiple time all-star, member of the NBA 75 club. There it's very obvious to 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 point and we can see clear as day why that team did not ultimately at least make it to the conference finals. It's because when you need people to step up in big situations or in situations when they're needed to increase their output, they have not been able to do that. All we're going to talk about for the for until or the foreseeable future. When we talk about this Philadelphia situation is, of course, we're going to talk about James Harden. We're going to talk about how James Harden, uh, how his playoff numbers drastically declined from his regular season or how the James Harden that not just in in Philadelphia, but James Harden in general, how it just seems like his playoff when he hits the playoffs 
his 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 game just drastically takes a nosedive. But we have time today. So let me let me shelf this James Harden conversation for a second. Let me talk, let me talk solely to Joel Embiid. Because trust and believe, this we're we're gonna we're going to fully dissect this James Harden situation and 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 you know why James Harden wants to trade, where he can go. We're gonna talk about all that. But what I want to do, because I, I don't see a lot of people doing this. In fact, I see a lot of people absolving Joel Embiid for the lack of success that the Philadelphia 76ers have had. You see, it's not just on Doc Rivers. It's not just on James Harden. It's not just on Joel Embiid. I mean, uh, Mac, uh, Tyrese Maxey. Joel Embiid is their best player. We talked about legacies, right? Imagine if someone as great as Hakeem Olajuwon never made it to a conference final or to this point of his career has not made it to a conference finals and how it's looking right now doesn't seem like he's going to make a conference finals in 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 the foreseeable future imagine that imagine if Nikola Jokic never made it to a conference final imagine if Tim Duncan never made it to a conference final what I'm saying and in the big moments when Hakeem Olajuwon would be was needed, Tim Duncan was needed, Nicole Jokic was needed, Shaquille O'Neal was needed, they come up short every single time. We would kill them. Or, let me say this, we would have a very hard conversation about their ranking and the all-time rankings, about, about how are they really a superstar, are they really... A, fran- a franchise changing player. Don't get me wrong, man. Joel Embiid is all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> Joel Embiid is a phenomenal center. He's one of the most skilled offensively. He's one of the most skilled big men we've ever seen. When his 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 there's not much of a drop off when we talk about his offensive game compared to his defensive game. Defensively, he's one of the best centers in the league. Offensively, he's one of the best centers in the league. But that does not negate the fact that he has come up short every single time in the playoffs. I mean, think about it. You had a 3-2 lead against the, the Boston Celtics this year. And you had game six at your crib. Up 3-2. And you get destroyed. Like blown out. Oh no. You don't you lose. You get destroyed game seven. You lose. Hell, James Harden won Philadelphia two games this year. Now, yes, those games that he did win, he averaged like 32 points or something like that. But the game that they lost, he averaged like 12. So that is a precipitous drop. But what I'm saying is this. When we talk about why Philadelphia is here. And when you look up what is here. You're going to lose arguably your best. No, I ain't really no arguably. Even though I do like Tyrese Maxey. You're, you're losing your second best player pro- probably. You're nowhere closer to a championship than you were before your second best player got there. And your team is going to look drastically different. And as we talk today, the reigning MVP has never been to a conference finals. People talk about uh, the, the big shot that Kawhi Leonard had against Philly. Which, by the way, had Philadelphia, had Joel Embiid and Jimmy Butler on that team. And we, they talk about the big shot, you know, the, the game seven Shot the Kawhi Leonard hit. Mind you, that was not in the conference finals. Toronto had to go on, I think, and play Milwaukee. Joel Embiid has never been to a conference final. Not once. 
and a lot of a lot of his uh lack of success in the in the playoffs definitely has gotten to this point not it's not the main reason don't get me wrong it's not the main reason at all it's definitely a sub subplot to this but it is here it is there and it it is what it is <laughs> But let's get back to James Harden. And as we just talked about Joel Embiid, James Harden has just as much to do with the lack of success or the lack of advancement in the playoffs that then, you know, the, the same amount of, uh, I guess, blame you can say that Joel Embiid has. I've said this time and time again. In fact, I said this when they got James Harden. You didn't, they didn't bring in James Harden to lead the league and assist. Yes, they want James Harden to be an, a, a great assist man because, I mean, you're playing with arguably one of the best, if not the best center in the league at the time. But they didn't bring James Harden there to be an assist man. They brought James Harden to bring, to, to bring the scoring repertoire that he had in Houston. They want that. They wanted that James Harden. That James Harden not only could have brought them to a conference championship that James Harden possibly could have got them to an NBA finals. I mean, think about it. The James Harden that we saw in Houston probably would have made it to an NBA finals if they did not run into the dynasty warriors, the Kevin Durant, Steph Curry warriors. But that James Harden is far from gone. The James Harden that Philly got was the inconsistent, timid at times, lost at times, sensational at times, downright frustrating James Harden. To the point where you look up, this is to me, that trade, when you look at the, the aftermath of the James Harden Ben Simmons trade, this is the first lose lose trade I can um, remember in the NBA. Because when you look up, what did Philly really got get? They got to the same exact place that they had that they were that they were in when they had Ben Simmons. And the Nets. Did nothing. There was a lot that got them to this point. A lot of things. And main and and, and we sit here today and this is yet another stop that didn't work for James Harden. And yet another stop where James Harden was expected to be more than what he produced. Now let's 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 build on that. Build on that idea. Let's look at this from the Philly side as far as now we know that James Harden at, or Philly and James Harden is is working on a trade. People are asking, should they trade James Harden? Should they keep James Harden? I'll say this. People are saying, uh, hmm. here's why I think it would not be smart to keep James Harden. Now, yes, if you want to keep him for a year. No, the reason why it's not smart to keep James Harden is because you technic now that you know that that both te both sides, the Harden side and the, and the Philadelphia side, are both working on a trade. You know that it's not going to work, and you know that eventually, whether you keep you don't, if you do keep them, you have them for one year tops, which means that you try to get the most that you can, whether that's expiring contracts, whether that's draft picks. You try to get as much as you can get, because if you play him this year. I, I don't think, even if you ultimately win a championship, I, I honestly don't think that James Harden is going to stay. 
Because every single time James Harden on the, on the move, you hear the same thing. James Harden's extremely upset with with the organization. We heard that about or, uh, or we heard that about Houston. We heard that about Brooklyn. We heard that about OKC. And now we hear that about Philly. So I just don't think, even if they win a championship next year, which I highly doubt, that James Harden can just then leave for nothing. So I think that it would be beneficial, not to mention, more than likely, James Harden's asking for a two to four year deal. Which is upwards of a hundred million, more of course more than that, but he's probably asking for a two to four year deal. So you have to ask yourself if you're Philly, is this the type of player? Is James Harden the type of player that you want to attach yourself to for two to four more years? And if you're asking me that, I would have to answer it by saying, what have you done? Where have we been? Have, how have you made me better in the two years that we've had you? Now, if you want to be, if you're in James Harden camp and you want to say, well, Joel and B didn't win a championship. I mean, didn't, not championship. Joel and B didn't win an MVP till we got here. You're like, okay, yeah, yeah. But Joel Embiid was still great before you got here. And honestly, Joel Embiid is in the same exact spot that he was in or is the same exact player that he was before you got here. The only difference is he now has an MVP. But if you talk about team success, Philadelphia is nowhere closer to a championship than they were with Jimmy Butler, than they were with Ben Simmons. So I think, while yes, you hear the big name of James Harden, you think, damn, like I don't want to lose such a big name. But at the end of the day, to me, this is beneficial for Philly, which is why I don't think you hear anybody like really lamenting the fact that they're more than likely going to lose James Harden. Now. What it's sounding like is the Clippers is a, is in the lead in a likely destination. The Clippers have a bunch of expiring contracts. I mean, you can get a Terrence Mann. You can get a Robert Covington. You can probably get a, a, a big that's on the bench and a couple draft picks. And if you're a Philadelphia, you want to get expiring contracts, especially with the whole CBA thing. And, and next year, they'll probably be off the books. So then you can build your team more and you can, I think Phil, I think the Clippers are in that one more time realm. Shouts out to Ben, uh, Bill Simmons of the Bill Simmons podcast, the ringer. He had a segment with uh, Ryan Rosillo and they were talking about one more time teams, the teams that are looking at their, or the organization that are looking at their rosters and thinking we should run it back one more time. And of course, one of them, uh, brought up the Clippers, and I I wholeheartedly agree. I think that the Cl- I don't know if the Clippers should be a one more time team, but I think that they're going to look at their roster and they're going to convince themselves. Hey, if Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are healthy, we'll see we'll see what it looks like in the playoffs. Now, again, I think there's at some point there gets to a na- naive point. Or, you know, it's kind of it's kind of being fueled by naivety at that point because it's like, when have they ever been healthy in the playoffs? But I do think that the 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 Clippers are looking at themselves as a one more time team. So with them looking at them looking at themselves like that, they're of course going to take a flyer on I mean, James Harden does make them better. Let's let's be real. James Harden is still a a positive player in the league. He's not like a, a detriment. Now, is he a player at this point of his career that if you when James Harden was on Houston, right? When he was at the peak of his powers. James Harden was most definitely one of those players where 
you could say if you drop him on most teams in the NBA, they are at least playoff contenders. That's how good James Harden was. James Harden was in that realm where it doesn't matter what team you're on, you are a playoff caliber team. James Harden is not at that point in his career at this point. However, you match him with a Kawhi Leonard, with a Paul George, possibly with a Russell Westbrook, that definitely changes things. So I think that the Clippers are kind of in the lead as far as to get James Harden. I also would look at a team like Miami. I mean, we we understand that Miami is one of those teams that, or Miami last year in the NBA Finals, they didn't lose because of defense. They lost because they couldn't throw a rock in an ocean. They just could There was multiple droughts or offensive scoring droughts, a multiple. And they just ran into a better team, which was the, the Denver Nuggets. So I think if you're Philly, you have to be like, okay, you know, you you have to in the back of your mind, you're going to be like, hey, this is this this is beneficial for us. We weren't trying to pay him a three to four year deal. We James Harden hasn't shown that he can make a team considerably better because, I mean, think about it. Philly had one of the better rosters in the league last year. In fact, Every single year, James Harden has been there, and especially last year with P.J. Tucker. And to only make it to the second round two straight years is crazy. So if you're James Harden, let's talk about, the, let's talk about James Harden's camp. And this is where that whole legacy thing comes in. James Harden, one time, I don't remember what episode it was. You can go Google it or you can YouTube it, you know. I talked, I said James Harden was the enigma of the NBA. And that sediment, that thought could not be more true at this very moment. Because when you think, sitting here today, and if you're listening to me, if you're watching me, ask yourself this. What is James Harden's legacy? Think about it. I'll give you a second. What is James Harden's legacy? Let me let me tell you how I'll answer that question. How I would answer that. James Harden, at least at this moment of his career. Because as we know, championships change a lot of things. Championships change the way that we view some players. Rightfully so. Like, a championship drastically changed how we looked at players like Dirk Nowinski, players like Jason Kidd. Championships drastically changed the way we looked at players like, uh, I mean, at this point, Jamal Murray, Nicole Jokic. Championships drastically changed the way that we looked at players like Klay Thompson, Draymond Green. Imagine if Draymond Green didn't have a championship. He would be a, we would probably look at that man as a bigger, taller Patrick Beverly. Championships change the way that we look at players. So I said that to say, if James Harden ultimately wins a championship, I'm sure we will look at him differently or we would describe him differently. And then, and, and, and on the contrary, or, or pair, uh, on the opposite side, not winning a championship changes the way that we talk about people. And I've talked about this before, so this isn't new. Ch- not winning a championship changed the way that we talked. Um, think about that. Think about how we talked about Kevin Garnett before he won a championship and after. Think about how they talk about Allen Iverson. 
how they talk about Charles Barkley, how they talk about John Stockton, how they talk about Carmelo Anthony, how they talk about Vince Vince Carter, how they talk about Tracy McGrady, how they're talking about Damian Lillard right now. Championships and not winning a championship changes the way we talk about people. So I asked y'all, how would we describe, or how would you describe James Harden's legacy at this moment? Leave it in the comments. Uh, Let's talk about it. But let me explain to you how I would answer that question. James Harden will go down as one of the greatest offensive weapons the league has ever seen. The way he's able to manipulate refs and and get to the line, his step back three is, is pretty much patented at this time or at this moment uh, he's one of the greatest Houston Rockets players we've ever seen um, I mean there's a reason why he landed on this all NBA 75 team and, and nobody really bad an eye we understand how great especially at the peak of his powers James Harden is But that's not where his legacy stops. James Harden's also a player that how great he was, he never reached his maximum potential. Now, some of that is, of course, on James Harden, because there was multiple times in the playoffs where he should have advanced further than he did. It was just because of him, not because of who he played. Because, yes, there were times, of course, the Golden State Warriors and stuff, but There were multiple times where they should have advanced and because he came up small, because he came up average, they didn't advance. For instance, a lot of people want to kill KD for losing the NBA finals. I think it was 2012, losing the NBA or 13, one, two, losing the NBA finals to uh, LeBron James and the Miami Heat. But nobody talks about just how bad James Harden was coming off the bench. And the fact of if James Harden would I think I think Kevin Durant averaged like 30 points in that play in that uh in the finals. But James Harden was god awful coming off the bench. You could talk about the flameouts against the early Golden State Warriors when the Houston Rockets had, they didn't have KD yet, they had Dwight Howard. You can talk about how it didn't work with Dwight Howard. You can talk about how it didn't work with Chris Paul. You can talk about the flameout against the Spurs when I think they were out Kawhi Leonard and Tony Parker, I believe. And Tim Duncan, I think. And James Harden was terrible. There was one game in Golden State. I think he had a triple-double because he had, or no, I think he had like the most turnovers in playoff history for a game of like eight or nine himself. Or maybe, maybe it was more than that. We can talk about, now yes, obviously it wasn't him mainly but you can talk about game seven against go the the kevin durant golden state warriors and how your team misses 27 straight threes or you can talk about the year the year after when kevin durant wasn't even there he was hurt and you couldn't seal the deal or we can talk about when the injury bug started to hit, especially when you got to Brooklyn. Oh, no, no, no. Let's let's back up a little bit. We can talk about how you never or James Harden never really took his phys- physique seriously and took his health seriously in the offseason. 
I'm not going to talk about the extracurricular. That has nothing to do with this. Well, actually, it does. But I'm not going to talk about it. What I will say is he. it seemed like he was more invested in the extracurricular activities than he was with refining his game and uh, getting his weight down, keeping his weight down, coming into training camp in shape instead of getting in shape during training camp. You could talk about that's when we can talk about the injuries started piling up, the hamstring injury in Brooklyn. And I think only playing like 16 games with KD and, and Kyrie. And then, of course, you can talk about the flame outs and, or the, the demanded trade from Houston. Or the demanded trade from Brooklyn. Or now the more than likely trade from Philly. Like I said, if we want to talk about the complete legacy of James Harden, of course you can talk about the scoring repertoire. You can talk about just where he lands on the greatest shooting guards of all time list. Is he top five? Is he not? I'll let you debate that. But you also have to talk about how he has been expected to be the missing piece for multiple teams. And by the end of his tenure on that team, they're still missing that piece. Or at the end of that ten of of the tenure of whatever team he's on, they're looking up and, and wondering why they didn't reach the potential that they should have. And a lot of the reason is because of James Harden. I don't like when they attach winning and losing to players. And what I mean by that is when they, for instance, they call Jordan Poole, he's not a winning player. They they say that, uh, you know, a lot of people like to say that Kevin Durant wasn't a winning player before he got to Golden State, which I think is crazy. I mean, you and I, and I agree with KD when he said you're attaching a team, a team stat to one player. What I will say is this, though, and this is what I will say is true. Basketball, and as a team sport, you all have to play a role to ultimately reach the goals that you're trying to reach. And some players play them to a T which is why you see success, which is why you see multiple years of success. Then there are some players that may play their role to a T to a certain point, and that's why you see a lack of success. And that has been James Harden. And the last thing I'm going to say about this is simple. You want to know the state of James Harden, or you want to know the feeling of James Harden or how we should view James Harden. Look at today. Just, just really think and look at today. We're talking about James Harden. And when I say look at today, right? When you look up, <laughs> both sides are happy. James Harden's side and Philly's side, both sides are happy. Because both sides are going to ultimately break up. That 
should tell you the status of James Harden. And you know what's also crazy? I think he's ultimately probably going to land in, in, in L.A. for the Clippers. I could be wrong, obviously, but I think a lot of signs are pointing to, especially when you see that the Clippers, in a surprising turn of events, were, uh, waived Eric Gordon to leave. You know, I think that he's going to end up a Clipper. And there's also reports saying that Russell Westbrook can also become a Clipper or go back to the Clippers, even if they get James Harden. And even with all that, you got to think to yourself. Listen to this. Listen to this lineup. Russell Westbrook at the one. James Harden at the two. Paul George at the three. Kawhi Leonard at the four. Zubox at the five. You hear that lineup and hear how incredible that a line, just namesake, how incredible that lineup is. How much you want to bet they probably won't be favored to win the championship next year? And I'm not saying that's because of James Harden, but James Harden obviously ain't helping. I'm not going to say it was a failed experiment. But what I will say is the heights that Philly thought they were going to reach and probably James Harden thought he was going to reach playing alongside Joel Embiid. Those heights were never reached. Not even close. And now, as we sit here today, we wait to see what the future holds for James Harden and for Philly. Because now they're saying that Philly, Kyrie Irving might be in the running to go to Philly now. Whew. We'll see about that. I didn't want this entire episode to be solely James Harden. And, and we're going to move. We're going to move on. I want to talk a little bit about the WNBA, seeing as though I haven't really talked about the WNBA at all this year outside of the beginning of the season and how we're truly watching an historic season for the WNBA. I'm not talking about, you know, the, 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 the fans and, and how they're watching. What I'm talking about is we are seeing the talent level. Now we thought, right, that it's going to be a, a two team re- two team race. Once, you know, the New York Liberty acquired John Quill Jones, once they acquired uh, Brianna Stewart, once they got Vandersloot, we thought that it was pretty much going to be a two-team race between the New York Liberty and the Vegas Aces. The Vegas Aces, who just come, came off a championship, they also had uh, acquired um, Candace Parker from the sky. We thought it was going to be a two-team race. And what we've seen is just the sheer talent level in the WNBA is shining. Because you see Connecticut, uh, Lisa Thompson, or Thomas, I'm sorry. She, she became or she has now the record for most triple doubles in WNBA history. Dewana Bonner, she was, she's dropping 40-point games. Of course, you have the Washington Mystics. Now, Shakira Austin, she is out for a couple weeks with, I think, a a hip injury. But you still have Elena Deladon. You have um, just just, uh, uh, Natasha Cloud. Even, Even the bad teams. I mean, yes, the Seattle Storm are 4 and 11. But every single night I hear about Drew Lloyd going crazy. Drew Lloyd is pretty much the 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 WNBA version of Kyrie talking about on the court. I mean, just the other night she went up against uh, the Minnesota Lynx and dropped 41. Another night, I think she had 40. I don't remember who it was against, but she had 40 the other, uh, another night. 
or 38 or something like that. The talent level of the WNBA is is on is at an all time high. Hell, we can talk about how uh, Aaliyah Boston is is like the first rookie since like 2009, I believe. First rookie to 2009 to be named to the All Star team. We can talk about the Bumake sisters going crazy in or playing well for the for the uh, for LA. And of course, with all that, you still have the dominant team. Uh the as we sit today, the Vegas Aces are the fir- the third team in WNBA history. I know the Sparks did it and the Comets did it back in the day. Comets. The the Vegas Aces are the third team in NBA hit or WNBA history to be 14 and 1. And we're watching a squad. <laughs> When you have Chelsea Gray, and you know she she has deemed herself, and people have deemed her the point guard of the WNBA because of some of the, you know, she's just the offensive weapon. When we talk about shooting and court vision, and some of the the passes that she's done has been incredible. And you know what's you know it's Asia Wilson who is arguably the best player in the WNBA. She comes to she comes to play every night. You still have you have you you still have Candace Parker who has been integrated and integrated herself in this team perfectly. You still have Kelsey Plum, who is a deep range a deep range sniper. Jackie Young. Who can give you 30 on any given night? We're watching. This is one of you know, when we talk about uh we talk about the WNBA and we talk about some of the great teams in WMA history. Like I said, we can talk about the Comets, uh, and how great they they were. I think they won like four straight or something like that. Cheryl Swoops. Uh we can talk about the Minnesota Lynx that had uh, Maya Moore. And Sylvia Fowles. We can talk about the Sparks when they had Tina Tina Thompson. This Vegas Aces team is one of how it was constructed, how they're playing, is one of the greatest WNBA teams that we've ever seen, at least to this point. Now, yes, they could ultimately lose. I know they did just beat the New York Liberty pretty handily, by the way, but they could ultimately lose. We do need to see how the season's capped there's no one that's when we talk about greatest nba teams uh, for some reason a lot of people well not some reason a lot of people don't put that uh 2016 golden state warriors team the team that went 73 and 9 they don't usually put them as greatest of all time because they didn't ultimately win so yes we're going to have to the, the vegas aces in my opinion have to solidify it with a championship but even if they do, this will be their second straight championship. And they're playing there it's while yes, the talent level in the WNBA is is great throughout. And and this is one of the deepest talent pools as far as the the wor- the worst team, the Mercury. Three and eleven, the worst team in the WNBA right now. They still have I mean, I know that uh Skylar Dickens hasn't been playing, but they still have Skylar Dickens. They st- still have um, Bri- uh, Diana Taurasi. They, they they have they have uh, oh man, uh, I f- why is her name escaping me? I forgot her name. And I apologize to her. They were just talking. She was just in whatever. Well, there there is there is talent throughout this entire. Even Atlanta, I mean, you still have Rain Howard, you know, Ryan Howard. So what I'm saying is you're getting great basketball. The sky, they, they, <laughs> they, oh boy, what I'm, what I'm saying is this. 
I understand that this is a tough part of the season for sports fans. Um, you know, with no NBA, no football, no college football, no college NBA or college basketball. Uh, all you really have is baseball for a lot of people. What I'm saying is you also have the WNBA. And any given night, you are watching some of the best the league has to offer. And you're watching probably the most talented season the league has ever seen. Again, you're watching a team right now possibly form into a dynasty and I know that word has been thrown around a lot these last few <laughs> last few months talking about the Golden State Warriors and is that dynasty over is the Denver Nuggets a new dynasty uh we talked about the Oklahoma Sooners dynasty we talked about is the Chiefs a dynasty that the word dynasty has been thrown around a lot and while I'm not ready to crown the Vegas Aces a dynasty. I mean, they ultimately have to win this year. But they look head and shoulders better than everybody else. That's just that's just the truth. And uh, a lot of their players are going to be there for the foreseeable future. And we are watching... Any given that again, Jewel Lloyd, Natasha Colliard, uh, Nef- Nef- I forgot her, I know her name, last name's Colliard from Minnesota Lynx. She had like 38, and Jewel Lloyd had 30 or 41 in a loss. Aaliyah Boston continues to get a double double. You still have Elena Deladon going crazy, Ariel Atkins going crazy. A sniper from from beyond the arc. Brittany Griner. That's what it was. I apologize, Brittany Griner. I forgot your name. I apologize. It slipped my mind. But even the worst team has Brittany Griner. And she's been going. She's been she's been hooping. So what I'm saying is this, man. Go watch. If if you just need that basketball fix. Or not even just that. If you want to watch good basketball, you know what I'm saying? If you want to if you want to uh watch some of the most talented people play the sport of basketball, on any given night there is a WNBA game. And if you don't think I, if you think I'm capping, if you think I'm bull, I'm BSing, there is a team currently that is 14 and 1. And beating people pretty handily too. And the second best team that we thought was going to be the second best team is currently ranked third. A team that has Brianna Stewart and John Quell Jones, Sabrina Nadescu, uh, Vandersloot is ranked third. That should tell you all you need to know. And there you have it, man. Today was a quick one. Today was a quick one. Uh, wasn't much to talk about. <laughs> but there you have it. That has been today's episode of the Unpopular Podcast. I truly appreciate you guys. Um, if you want a popular podcast shirt, hoodie, sweater, long sleeve joggers, the link is in the description below. I have multiple different colors, multiple different designs. Get your Unpopular Podcast merch today. Also, please subscribe to the youtube channel please subscribe to wherever you're listening please subscribe to wherever you're watching again i am tr- my, my goal is to get to a thousand subscribers by my birthday i am at 860 i completely appreciate everyone that's already s- subscribed and um everyone that is going to subscribe definitely appreciate you coming along for the ride uh definitely means a lot man definitely means a lot and uh also subscribe to the socials you know the the instagram the twi- tiktok again almost daily i drop content and uh yeah man uh definitely i definitely appreciate all you guys and until next time much love